Good evening, and welcome to the Germantown Athenaeum Symposia. I want to tell you just briefly why we call it the Athenaeum Symposia. It comes from the word Athens, which of course, as you know, is the capital of Greece, and it comes from the goddess Athena, who is the goddess of wisdom. And at each of our presentations and events, we hope that we will gain a great deal of wisdom. And I know with Frank Islam tonight that we will gain that wisdom. The word symposia, which is the second word in the title, is the name for an intellectual discussion. And following Mr. Islam's talk, we will have an intellectual discussion and you will be afforded the opportunity to ask questions. And so I wanted to say welcome and thank you for coming and thank you for engaging in our intellectual discourse. And I would like to welcome our esteemed and marvelous and wonderful president of Montgomery College, Dr. Pollard, to introduce our guest speaker, Mr. Islam. Well, I'd like to thank our esteemed, lovely, phenomenal dean uh, for bringing this project to our institution and for certainly ensuring that we engage our college community under, uh, in, I think, phenomenal intellectual pursuits, because that is indeed what we are as an institution of higher education. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I am delighted to be here this evening. Uh, I am Darian Pollard, the proud president of Montgomery College, and I'd like to certainly recognize our provost for this campus, Dr. Sanjay Rai, and thank him and the wonderful team here uh, for making this event possible. I think it's very appropriate that we are having this event here at Montgomery College. Certainly the idea that community colleges are potentially the most transformative institution in contemporary America. I've often said that the community college is the reimagined land-grant institution of the United States, building the infrastructure and ensuring that our workforce has keen skills and the ability to respond to the ever-changing needs of our, of our country. We're preparing for the workforce of the future. We're doing that in STEM education, we're doing that in the humanities, we're doing that in the health sciences, and I believe that we are indeed building the infrastructure that's needed to repair the architecture of our country. In other words, to ensure that the American dream is accessible to everyone, Montgomery College must make sure that we are accessible to everyone. I had the pleasure of meeting our guest speaker a week ago when he was actually here participating in a forum where we had a panel where we actually grappled with these very ideas, particularly as it relates to STEM fields. Uh, it became very quickly that Mr. Islam is a shining example of the American dream of hard work that is needed to build a successful life and the idea that success also means you give back to your community. He's a very dedicated uh, philanthropist, but moreover, he's also someone who has a deep passion for what the American dream is about. Uh, Mr. Islam grew up in India, and at the age of 15, his then professor mentor, from what I understand, brought him to the United States to study uh, at the University of Colorado. He went on then to earn a bachelor's and master's degree in computer science from that very fine institution. He then moved to Washington, D.C., and began working for the federal government. And in 1994, with a true entrepreneurial spirit, he took out a modest home equity loan and founded his own government contracting company, QSS Systems, specializing in information technology, aerospace engineering services, and systems integration. A business that started with a single employee himself had grown to th in 13 years to 2,000 employees. I think that's pretty impressive. And in 2007, he sold his company for hundreds of millions of dollars. He has received personal and professional accolades, which I think is so important. Too many to name, but I'm going to do a small sampling because I think it's noteworthy of uh, the quality and caliber of this lecture series that we have here. Ernst Young touted him as the Maryland Entrepreneur of the Year. 
U.S. Small Business Administration selected him as the Minority Small Business Person of the Year for the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. And under uh, Mr. Islam's leadership, QSS earned a spot in the Inc. 500 for six consecutive years in the Hall of Fame, the Washington Technology Fast 40 for seven consecutive years and in its Hall of Fame, Deloitte & Touche National Tech Fast 500 for eight consecutive years. I like to say the word consecutive because you see oftentimes people do something once and then they make a big deal out of it. I think the idea that you do something over and over and over again says a lot. The Washington Technology Top 100 Federal Prime Contractor for six consecutive years. And today, Mr. Islam serves as the chairman and CEO of another one of his ventures, FI Investment Group, a holding company that owns healthcare and IT companies. He and his wife, who cannot be here tonight with us though, give back to the community. And I think that's a very important part of the American dream. They are generous supporters of organizations such as the Brookings Institute, the Woodrow Wilson Center for American Peace, and the University of Colorado at Boulder. He currently serves as the member of the International Advisory Council of the U.S. Institute of Peace, the Democratic and National Committee National Advisory Board, the Advisory Committee of the Export-Import Bank of the United States, and the Department of Commerce Industry Trade Advisory Council. He also serves as an advisory board member of the University of Maryland's Robert H. Smith School of Business, and most recently as a board member of the Strathmore. In his spare time, if he has any, he is a contributor to several publications, including the Huffington Post, India Express, Economic Times, and India Abroad. And finally, which I think is a very compelling, the reason that he is here tonight, he recently co-authored a book entitled Renewing the American Dream, A Citizen's Guide for Restoring America's Competitive Advantage. He just gave me my own personal autographed copy, which I'm very excited about to start reading. To discuss his findings and how they relate to our college mission, please join me in welcoming Mr. Islam. Thank you very much. I should have Dr. Pollard everywhere for my introduction. <laughs> you guys ready? I'm going to give you all kinds of numbers today. You're going to digest some of them. Some of them you probably forget about it, but don't worry about it. It's on my webpage, my speeches. It's uh, www.frankislam.com. So you don't have to make all the notes. You can get it from my webpage. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Dr. Pollard, for your kind introduction, and thank you for your leadership. You're indeed a constant source of inspiration to all of us. You're leading this college respectfully, thoughtfully, and responsibly. All of us should stand shoulder to shoulder with Dr. Pollard for her vision, for her values, for her passion, and for her commitment. I'd like to also take this opportunity to thank all of you for coming, and thank you for your hospitality. I appreciate your warm welcome. I've always held Montgomery College in high esteem. All of you should be thankful for the opportunity to attend and graduate from this outstanding institution. Before I begin my speech, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Rai Sanjay, who happens to share with me my history and my heritage and a wonderful meal that he's provided me this evening. And Elena, who has been more than generous and kinder to me. I've known her for many years, and she's the best and the brightest of all. And the dean, Joan Nock, who I met, I believe about a week ago. She's, she's a wonderful. And you know what? I'm the last one in this series, so be kind to me. <laughs> and I'll do my best. But anyway, thank you very much for inviting me today to speak to you on the global economy, which is a favorite topic of mine, and my book, Renewing the American Dream and Restoring Our Competitive Advantage. This book is available on Amazon. I hope you buy one. If you don't, send me an email. To my, through my webpage, I'll be more than happy to send you a copy. It's only about $10. It's not very expensive. 
So I wrote this book as a citizen who has realized the American dream, who's deeply concerned about the future of America and the American dream. I'm here today to tell you why, what I think needs to be done about it. As I'm sure most of you know that the American economy is in recovery mode since the mid-2009. That is the good news. The bad news is that the economic recovery by itself would not be enough. That is because what we need to succeed in the future to build America is the renewal, not just the recovery. To renew America, we need to have a competitive advantage. So let me address this issue by sharing some numbers, reviewing where the United States stands in the global economy, and outlining some steps that should be taken to address our situation. Finally, I will share my thoughts on what role higher education play, and you as a student can play on renewing the America and the American dream. And I'm gonna give you a lot of numbers, so be patient with me. So let's begin with the number. Here they are, 8.3%, 11.7%, 15.1%, 35%, 61.8%, 19%, These numbers take a special meaning when you put them into context. However, they only tell part of our story. 8.3%, that is the most recent official unemployment rate in America. The real unemployment rate is almost twice, close to 20 to 25%. 11.7% represents the manufacturing contribution to the GDP based upon the latest available data. Just three decades ago, during Ronald Reagan's administrations, manufacturing contribution to the GDP was at 20%. Now it is half of that. Most of the jobs have been shipped to overseas. 15.1% was the official poverty rate in 2010. This was the highest it has been in more than five decades. 15.1% translate to one in seven Americans also remember, this number does not include the working poor who are above the poverty threshold. 35% is the percentage of Americans who lived in middle class households in 2006. At the beginning of this century, just 10 short years ago, the number was almost 40%. 61.8% that is the percentage of the total job loss in quarter four of 2010 that came from a small business. In the same period, a small business only created 54.1% of the new job. That is the first time in America's recorded history that small business job losses were higher than jobs created. That is not a good story. 19% represents a decline in the net worth of American household in 2009. 19% may not sound like a lot, but it translates into a loss of $1.5 trillion. Now 1.7% was the real GDP growth rate last year. Most forecasts are that the growth rate for the 2012 will be 3.0%. We need to get above 3.4% to really start to prime the, necess the recovery pump. These numbers matter to average American. What makes them even worse is the, is the increase in income inequality, income injustice in the United States between 1979 and the year 2007. The Congressional Budget Office documented in a report released in the last quarter of 2011 in that time period, the top 1% of Americans saw their income increase by 275%, while the bottom fifth saw an increase of only 20%. Alan Kruger, 
while not personally, Chairman of the White House Council of Economic Advisor noted in a speech after the report came out, and I quote, inequality in income is causing an unhealthy division in opportunities and is a threat to our economic growth. End of the quotation. Paul Ryan, the chairman of the House Budget Committee, released a paper with some sentiments similar to Alan Kruger. A key point in that paper was, and I quote, the question for policymakers is not how best to redistribute a shrinking pie. The focus ought to be on increasing living standards, expanding economic opportunity, and promoting upward mobility for all, end of the quote. Now that's the view from the left, and that's the view from the right. However, there is a consensus in America today that economic inequality is a problem that threatens our competitive advantage. The question is what to do about it, and that is what I'm here to talk about. It's one of my favorite topics. The country's competitive advantage hinges on a strong domestic economy, an economic and, and social leadership in the, in the international arena. Now, there are some of the internal sources of competitive advantage that include ample supply of decent paying jobs, a vibrant and growing middle class, a strong manufacturing sector, innovative and entrepreneurial small businesses. I've devoted a chapter in my book in this area that I co-authored and provided a detailed analysis of where we stand and specific improvement recommendations. Because of their critical importance in restoring our competitive advantage, I will share some of my ideas, first on manufacturing, and then on small business with you later in my speech. The topic today for my speech is the status, where do we stand in the global economy? We are running into a brick wall that is Brazil, Russia, India, and China. These nations have already become much fiercer economic competitors than any time we faced in the last quarters of the 20th, 20th century. And they will become even tougher competitor in the 21st century. They all have a substantial populations. They all have a substantial middle class. And with the exception of Russia, they devote a very minor part of the nation's budget to security, defense, and military expenditure. They also have the government. They are more hands-on and directly involved in economic development than our government is. They engage in state-run capitalism, while we here in the United States believe in and practice free market capitalism. So we are faced with a formidable competition. One of the things that you do in business when you're trying to position for future success and create a competitive advantage is conduct an analysis. What I call them a SWOT analysis. is strength, weaknesses, opportunity, and threat. I do not have enough time to do an analysis on the United States and the countries that constitute the brick wall. However, let's take a quick look at the United States and our two most likely major contender, India and China. That was the topic for our dinner discussion today. So let's just start with the United States. What are our primary strengths and weaknesses? Professor Michael Porter, a managing professor at the Harvard Business School, and the foremost authority on competitive advantage, did an analysis of the United States in the year 2009. Some of the strength professor identified where we are good in innovation, science, technology, research and development, entrepreneurship, free and open competition. These are our strengths. The weaknesses we have, the human resource challenges, we, have to, we need to restructure our public education system. 
we have indeed a very high healthcare cost. Based upon the analysis, we also made some recommendations in our book, and some of the strengths we identified were, we are good at a small, as a small business, our Amer American democracy, our higher educational system, and our citizens' initiatives. Some of the other weaknesses we identified were as follows. We have deferred maintenance of our infrastructure, which is about a trillion dollar, are quickly beginning to look like a third world country in this area. Our declining capacity to manufacture goods here, for a variety of reasons, we invent it here and ship it there to be made and overseas. Over the past year, we have begun to correct this problem, and the President Obama has talked about insourcing. But we have a long way to go. And the next thing, our dysfunctional Congress. That's understatement. <laughs> our Congress is deeply divided, deeply dysfunctional, and deeply partisan politics. They're there to advance their own agenda, or the agenda of the special interest group. They should be there to advance the America's cause, America's interest, America's mission, America's vision, and America's values. And we have an election coming. I'm here to tell you, no matter who gets elected, Democrat or Republican, until we change the rule of the game, it don't matter much who sits in those seats. Dr. Pollard agrees with me. So let's talk about India, where I came from, as a competitor. I just came back about two weeks ago from India. Let's do some analysis about India, because they're gonna be the real competitor for us very soon. India is a country of one billion people and 200 million middle class. India has had extremely positive GDP growth of between six to 8% for the past three years. The GDP in 2011 estimated to be 7.8%, while our GDP growth grew only about 3.0% last year. India is vibrant, is the world's largest democracy. Their strength includes in capabilities in math and science, innovation, and business sophistication. Its weakness includes deficiencies in its infrastructure, which is crumbling, healthcare, deeply corrupted society, and extreme pockets of poverty. And a lot of income inequality and injustice, as depicted in the Academy Award winning movie, Slumdog Millionaires, as you probably have seen it. So let's talk about China as a competitor. China is a country of 1.3 billion people. China has been hitting in and out, it out of the park in forms of GDP growth over the past three years with GDP growth even higher than India's. Its GDP, gro GDP growth in 2011 was 9.2%. That's a three times more than ours. If, a fact worth noting is that China is already creating an incredible wealth. As reported by Forbes magazine in the year 2011, there were already 146, get this, Chinese billionaires and thousands and thousands of millionaires. But China's strength includes its public investment in infrastructure, and its international investment, such as buying U.S. Treasury bonds so we can invade another country. We borrowed the money from China, Australian <laughs> iron core, and African farmland. They're all over in Africa. Its weakness includes its undereducated, underdeveloped, rural areas, and a lack of innovation. So that's where we stand. So this, that is the tale of the tape of the United States of America, India. 
and China. The competitive analysis clearly demonstrates that we are in a real battle, and then if we want to remain preeminent, we are going to have up our game and get better. We cannot accomplish that just by reducing the budget deficit or debt, or scaling back government, or pointing fingers, or, or placing blame on others. We need to get all hands on board, develop a common vision, and create a winning game plan, and then prepare it and execute to perfection. So let me make some recommendation for accomplishing things as we look at the United States as an enterprise. I call them Enterprise USA. That should become the citizen's business. We need to ensure that we do not just cut cost, but that we also build capacity and a competence. We also need to be sure the country not only grows GDP, but that it also builds economic, individual, well, being. If this does not happen, we will continue down this slippery slope to becoming a country of few haves, many have-nots, and many, many, many more than have a lot less. But it should be a shared venture among the government, business, and nonprofit organization, and us as a citizen of this beloved country. To make this reality, let me recommend the following thing. We should establish a national global competition commission. In my opinion, that commission is far more important for the future of America and the American dream than the National Commission for Fiscal Responsibility and Reform was. America needs a plan, and we need it now. This commission should draft a 21st century competitive advantage plan for the United States to drive that turnaround and transformation of the United States. That plan should set out the broad goals and meet the following requirements. We should address the analysis that we talked about in strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threat, provide the framework, define an innovations, re-industrialization policy, rebuild our infrastructure, which is crumbling, and promote individual economic well-being. This should also include recommendation for renewing manufacturing, but also the most important thing we should do, renew small businesses. Manufacturing is very near dear to me. I have written many, many papers in prior to the White House and to the Congress. America was built on manufacturing. It is a still major contributor to our economy. Manufacturing is an economic engine and a job machine. The consider this, the United States is the world's mightiest manufacturing economy producing 21% of all goods made globally. Japan produces only 13% and China 12%. For every dollar U.S. manufacturers spend directly, they foster another dollar forty in economic activity. Exports of good account for three-fifths of all U.S. sales abroad. Manufacturing still employs more than 11 million workers in the United States and still accounts for more than 11% of GDP. Manufacturing workers have higher pay and more generous benefits about 20% higher than those in non-manufacturing jobs. The manufacturing accounts for the country's research and development investment, which stimulates future growth and economic development. Manufacturing enables the maintenance of a strong national security and balanced trading relationship. Manufacturing of the United States has recovered significantly since the economic collapse of the 2008 that's the good news. The bad news is the industry rebound has not translated into significant reinvestment, job creations, or economic stimulus here in the United States yet. 
American manufacturing has lost more than a million jobs and over 30% of its total workforce from the year 2000 to 2009. Many, many towns in the United States, in the East Coast and West Coast, have become a ghost town because job has been shifted to overseas to other parts of the world. We must have a comprehensive plan to put manufacturing front and a center again in our economy. And we have made many, many recommendations in our book about manufacturing. And they include implement a targeted job tax credits for new high value jobs created by manufacturing company. The President Obama talked about insourcing. I call them reshoring. Create a reshoring tax incentive for United States company with high value jobs to bring those jobs back to the United States that we lost in many, many decades. We must create a balanced set of incentive working in collaboration with the states and the local government to bring high tech and advanced manufacturing company from around the world to make the United States the location of a choice. We must make the R&D tax credit permanent and consider increasing it by tying it to the jobs created and provide additional cre credit for producing goods here in the United States. The, my favorite one, United States company has a $1.5 trillion of profit stashed in the overseas bank. They must bring those dollars back here in the United States. However, the way our corporate taxes are, they have to pay taxes. And my suggestion to the Congress, and there's a, probably a bill in the Congress, that we must allow the deep patriation of the profit made overseas, but that must be tied with how many jobs you can create with those dollars. I do not want those, those dollars to go back to the stakeholders and buybacks of the stocks. And that's exactly what happened last time. So let's talk about a small business. I'm an entrepreneur, and as Dr. Powell said, I've created 2,000 jobs. I sold my company for several hundred million dollars. The entrepreneurs see an opportunity, but others see only challenge. Entrepreneurs play a pivotal role in creating jobs. If you are going to renew the American dream, we are going, we are going to need to think small to win big. The small business constitute 99% of the total business in the United States and account for more than 50% of the nation's GDP. The small business job created plummeted by 23% between 2007 and 2011. Why? In the large part, that is because they're having difficulty in getting access to the capital to expand operations to hire the new employees. They're the engine that drives our economy. We should once again become a hotbed for small business in America. The administration and the Congress understand the importance of a small business. In September of 2010, President Obama signed the bill, which we call a Small Business Job Act of 2010. Just last week, he signed the Jobs Act that stands for Jump to Start. Our business is startup, which was passed as a bipartisan piece, which is very rare in Congress these days, of legislation by the current Congress. I think we need to do more to put money directly in the hands of a small business. Two recommendations that I have made is to establish a national industry infrastructure and innovation bank and expand the government financial and technical assistance that is available to small businesses and entrepreneurs. Senator Kerry, Senator Warner, Senator Hutchinson have filed legislation to create a national financial infrastructure bank. I support the establishment of such a bank, but we recommend that this scope be expanded to include industry and innovation with a specific focus on providing the seed and the startup money for the new ventures 
an innovative business in early stages of their life cycles. On the government side, I think the Small Business Administration should implement a program to enable small businesses to participate more fully in exporting our products, funding the market in the foreign, mar in the foreign countries, and that should include direct loans as well as the loan guarantee. And we should also provide a comprehensive export assistance package. I also recommend the development of program targeted at attracting and retaining the talented and educated immigrants to our country and entrepreneurs. Paul Krugman, a Nobel Prize winning economics suggest, the United States should offer green cards to every foreign born graduates of America, top colleges and universities by allowing the world's most brilliant foreign born graduates America can spur economic growth, can spur technological progress, and maintain the youthfulness of its workforce. Since I'm here at higher education in Montgomery College, so I'd like to talk a little bit about, and I've talked in my book, what role does higher education play, or what's your responsibility in all of this? Higher education helps ensure higher aspirations. Higher aspirations provide individuals and nations forward. It was the access to the higher education for veterans after World War II that took the United States to the new heights and established our competitive advantage for the last half of the 20th century. We are fortunate here in America to have the greatest higher educational system in the world. People come here from all around the world to go to our school of higher education because they are indeed the best. I am a prime example of this. I came here from India, stayed, and became a citizen to pay back on the investment that this country has made in me. We need to make sure that other immigrants have the same opportunity that I had. We also have to ensure that higher education is playing a role in developing our leaders and as citizens of the future. But we must put emphasis on STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. But we also need to have higher education to focus on developing citizenship knowledge and skills and the most important to promote civic engagement. Our higher education has flourished because of our democracy and return our democracy has flourished because of our higher educational system. Our success as a nation and as a people is in large part attributable to higher education. Now, before I talk about what your role and responsibility should be to renew America and American dream, let me say a few words about community colleges. I firmly believe that community colleges are pivotal to the future of America by providing the skilled workforce that we need to compete in the global economy. The most important function of the community college is to equip students with the skills required productively enter the workforce to earn a good living and to make their contribution towards sustaining the American dream. Community college should become the gateway for entry and re-entry into the workforce and in well-paying jobs. In order to be that gateway, they must have the capacity and the competence to do the job properly. As a student in Montgomery College, you have an enormous opportunity to be an active participant in higher education and contributor to renew America and our dream and our nation's competitive advantage. My advice to all of you is to engage in this process as follows. Number one, be a lifelong learner. Never give up. Be a 21st century citizen 
and get engaged. Let me say a few words about the lifelong learner. Study hard, aim high, work, pursue your dream. But remember, the life's lessons are taught inside and outside the classroom and they're never ending. So commit to yourself to learning at least one new thing every day. That's not too much I'm asking you to do. Never give up. Winston Churchill, my favorite Prime Minister of Great Britain during the World War II, said to the schoolboys in London in 1941, near the beginning of World War II, and I quote, never give in, never give in, never, 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 never give in, except to conviction of honor and a good sense. And end of quotation. That was a good advice more than 70 years ago, and it is a good advice today. Now be a 21st century citizens and get engaged. Our citizens are losing confidence in the government and politics. Realize that it is up to us to change things we do not like. We cannot just complain and place blame. We need to be informed, get all the facts, independent, exercise our personal judgment as opposed to taking totally partisan politics. Be involved, active on issues that matter most to all of us. In closing, let me leave you with these following thoughts. The past decade has been one of the serious decline for the United States of America. In point of fact, we have been slipping economically for almost 30 years. While GDP was growing, our holding electively steady, the economic insecurity of our citizen was increasing year after year. Our GDP growth masked a serious deficiency in areas that matter for competitive advantage for the country and its citizen. As a mighty professor, Darren Esimoglu, perhaps I have not pronounced the name correctly, and Harvard professor James A. Robinson have written a new book titled, Why Nations Fail. In their book, the professors say nations thrive when they have inclusive political and economic institution and decline when they have extractive institution which concentrate power and opportunity in the hands of few. In an interview with Thomas Friedman of the New York Times, Professor Asimoglu said about the United States today, and I quote, the real problem is that economic inequality, when it becomes this large, translates into political inequality. So we are in a decisive decade as we approach the dawn of this new century. The decision we make today, the action we take will determine the future of America and the American dream. The future is promised to no one. We're looking for you to have the opportunity not to guarantee. That is why we need to look forward, not backward. It is why we need renewal rather than recovery. It is absolutely why we need to create a competitive advantage. Renewal and competitive advantage are the key to the success for America in the 21st century. All of you have a role and responsibility to shape our country's fate and future. I firmly believe that it is imperative for all of us to take more proactive and prominent role in the quest for America's future. We have to recognize that American dream is a continuous journey. That journey began and is sustained by the contribution of each and every one of you as an individual citizen. Remember, as long as we believe in ourselves, the future will always be ours. We must renew people's faith in the promise of this great country that we all love and care deeply. I agree with President Obama when he made this statement, and I quote, we must out-innovate, out-educate, and out-build the rest of the world to win the future. 
The person also said, and I quote, it is a feature that is ours to decide, ours to define, and ours to win. End of quotation. I firmly believe no hope has been too large, no dream has been too far out of reach in America. And for America, anything and everything is possible. All of us will do well to remember that when we work together, when we learn from one another, when we listen to each other, when we set aside our differences to work for shared goals. And I also believe firmly that the American dream is still possible for those who have a drive, desire, and discipline. Americans are strong, vibrant, responsible, and resilient. We are a country of dreamers and a doers. Therefore, I'm, I'm confident that if all of us work together to build America for the next generation, I can say that America's best days will be ahead of us, not behind us. And thank you for the opportunity to share my ideas, and God bless you. Thank you.